This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathy of www.skippopscratch.com. Bullfinch's Mythology The Age of Fable by Thomas Bullfinch. Chapter 18 Meliasier and Atalanta. One of the heroes of the Argonautic expedition was Meliasier, son of Aenus, and Althea, king and queen of Caledon. Althea, when her son was born, beheld the three destinies who, as they spun their fatal thread, foretold that the life of the child should last no longer than a brand then burning upon the hearth. Althea seized and quenched the brand, and carefully preserved it for years, while Meliasia grew to boyhood, youth, and manhood. It chanced then that Aenus, as he offered sacrifices to the gods, omitted to pay due honor to Diana, and she, indignant at the neglect, sent a wild boar of enormous size to lay waste the fields of Caledon. Its eyes shone with blood and fire, its bristles stood like threatening spears, its tusks were like those of Indian elephants. The growing corn was trampled, the vines and olive trees laid waste, the flocks and herds were driven in wild confusion by the slaughtering foe. All common aid seemed vain, but Meliasier called on the heroes of Greece to join in a bold hunt for the ravenous monster. Theseus and his friend Pyrithoas, Jason, Peleus, afterwards the father of Achilles, Telamon, the father of Ajax, Nestor, then a youth, but who in his age bore arms with Achilles and Ajax in the Trojan War, these and many more joined in the enterprise. With them came Atalanta, the daughter of Iasius, king of Arcadia. A buckle of polished gold confined her vest, an ivory quiver hung on her left shoulder, and her left hand bore the bow. Her face blent feminine beauty with the best graces of martial youth. Meliasier saw and loved. But now already they were near the monster's lair. They stretched strong nets from tree to tree, they uncoupled their dogs, they tried to find the footprints of their quarry in the grass. From the woods was a descent to marshy ground. Here the boar, as he lay among the reeds, heard the shouts of his pursuers, and rushed forth against them. One and another is thrown down and slain. Jason throws his spear with a prayer to Diana for success, and the favoring goddess allows the weapon to touch, but not to wound, removing the steel point of the spear in its flight. Nestor, assailed, seeks and finds safety in the branches of a tree. Telamon rushes on, but stumbling at a projecting root, falls prone. But an arrow from Atlanta, at length, for the first time tastes the monster's blood. It is a slight wound, but Meliasier sees and joyfully proclaims it. Anceus, excited to envy by the praise given to a female, loudly proclaims his own valor, and defies alike the boar and the goddess who has sent it. But as he rushes on, the infuriated beast lays him low with a mortal wound. Theseus throws his lance, but it is turned aside by a projecting bow. The dart of Jason misses its object, and kills instead one of their own dogs. But Meliasier, after one unsuccessful stroke, drives his spear into the monster's side, then rushes on and dispatches him with repeated blows. Then rose a shout from those around. They congratulated the conqueror, crowding to touch his hand. He, placing his foot upon the head of the slain boar, turned to Atalanta and bestowed on her the head and the rough hide, which were the trophies of his success. But at this envy excited the rest to strife. Plexippus and Toxius, the brothers of Meliasier's mother, beyond the rest opposed the gift, and snatched from the maiden the trophy she had received. Meliasier, kindling with rage at the wrong done to himself, and still more at the insult offered to her whom he loved, forgot the claims of kinship, and plunged his sword into the offender's hearts. 
as Althea bore gifts of thankfulness to the temples for the victory of her son, the bodies of her murdered brothers met her sight. She shrieks and beats her breast, and hastens to change the garments of rejoicing for those of mourning. But when the author of the deed is known, grief gives way to the stern desire of vengeance on her son. The fatal brand which once she rescued from the flames, the brand which the destinies had linked with Meliasia's life, she brings forth and commands a fire to be prepared. Then four times she essays to place the brand upon the pile, four times draws back, shuddering at the thought of bringing destruction on her son. The feelings of the mother and the sister contend within her. Now she is pale at the thought of the proposed deed, now flushed again with anger at the act of her son. As a vessel driven in one direction by the wind, and in the opposite by the tide, the mind of Althea hangs suspended in uncertainty. But now the sister prevails above the mother, and she begins as she holds the fatal wood. Turn, ye furies, goddesses of punishment, turn to behold the sacrifice I bring. Crime must atone for crime. Shall Aeneas rejoice in his victor's son, while the house of Thestius is desolate? But alas! To what deed am I born along? Brothers, forgive a mother's weakness. My hand fails me. He deserves death, but not that I should destroy him. But shall he then live, and triumph, and reign over Caledon, while you, my brothers, wander unavenged among the shades? No, thou hast lived by my gift. Die now for thine own crime. Return the life which twice I gave thee, first at thy birth, again when I snatched this brand from the flames. Oh, that that hast then died! Alas! Evil is the conquest, but, brothers, ye have conquered. And turning away her face, she threw the fatal wood upon the burning pile. It gave, or seemed to give, a deadly groan. Meliasia, absent and unknowing of the cause, felt a sudden pang. He burns, and only by courageous pride conquers the pain which destroys him. He mourns only that he perished by a bloodless and unhonored death. With his last breath he calls upon his aged father, his brother, and his fond sisters, upon his beloved Atalanta, and upon his mother, the unknown cause of his fate. The flames increase, and with them the pain of the hero. Now both subside. Now both are quenched. The brand is ashes, and the life of Meliasia is breathed forth to the wandering winds. Althea, when the deed was done, laid violent hands upon herself. The sisters of Meliasia mourned their brother with uncontrollable grief, till Diana, pitying the sorrows of the house that once had aroused her anger, turned them into birds. Atalanta the innocent cause of so much sorrow was a maiden whose face you might truly say was boyish for a girl, yet too girlish for a boy. Her fortune had been told, and it was to this effect, Atalanta, do not marry. Marriage will be your ruin. Terrified by this oracle, she fled the society of men, and devoted herself to the sports of the chase. To all suitors, for she had many, she imposed a condition which was generally effectual in relieving her of their persecutions. I will be the prize of him who shall conquer me in the race, but death must be the penalty of all who try and fail. In spite of this hard condition some would try. Hippomenes was to be judge of the race. Can it be possible that any will be so rash as to risk so much for a wife? said he. But when he saw her lay aside her robe for the race, he changed his mind and said, Pardon me, youths, I knew not the prize you were competing for. As he surveyed them he wished them all to be beaten, and swelled with envy for any one that seemed at all likely to win. While such were his thoughts the virgin darted forward. As she ran she looked more beautiful than ever. The breezes seemed to give wings to her feet, her hair flew over her shoulders, and the gay fringe of her garment fluttered behind her. 
a ruddy hue tinged the whiteness of her skin, such as a crimson curtain casts on a marble wall. All her competitors were distanced, and were put to death without mercy. Hippomenes, not daunted by this result, fixing his eyes on the virgin, said, Why boast of beating those laggards? I offer myself for the contest. Atalanta looked at him with a pitying countenance, and hardly knew whether she would rather conquer him or not. What god can tempt one so young and handsome to throw himself away? I pity him, not for his beauty, yet he is beautiful, but for his youth. I wish he would give up the race, or if he will be so mad. I hope he may outrun me. While she hesitates, resolving these thoughts, the spectators grow impatient for the race, and her father prompts her to prepare. Then Hippomenes addressed a prayer to Venus. Help me, Venus, for you have led me on. Venus heard, and was propitious. In the garden of her temple, in her own island of Cyprus, is a tree with yellow leaves and yellow branches and golden fruit. Hence she gathered three golden apples, and, unseen by anyone else, gave them to Hippomenes, and told him how to use them. The signal is given. Each starts from the goal and skims over the sand. So light their tread, you would almost have thought they might run over the river surface or over the waving grain without sinking. The cries of the spectators cheered Hippomenes. Now, now, do your best! Haste, haste! You gain on her! Relax not! One more effort! It was doubtful whether the youth or the maiden heard these cries with the greater pleasure. But his breath began to fail him, his throat was dry, the goal yet far off. At that moment he threw down one of the golden apples. The virgin was all amazement. She stopped to pick it up. Hippomenes shot ahead. Shouts burst forth from all sides. She redoubled her efforts and soon overtook him. Again he threw an apple. She stopped again, but again came up with him. The goal was near. One chance only remained. Now, goddess, said he, prosper your gift, and threw the last apple off at one side. She looked at it and hesitated. Venus impelled her to turn aside for it. She did so and was vanquished. The youth carried off his prize. But the lovers were so full of their own happiness that they forgot to pay due honor to Venus, and the goddess was provoked at their ingratitude. She caused them to give offense to Cybele. That powerful goddess was not to be insulted with impunity. She took from them their human form and turned them into animals of characters resembling their own. Of the huntress heroine, triumphing in the blood of her lovers, she made a lioness, and of her lord and master a lion and yoke them to her car, where they are still to be seen in all representations, in statuary or painting, of the goddess Cybele. Cybele is the Latin name of the goddess called by the Greeks Rhea and Ops. She was the wife of Kronos and the mother of Zeus. In works of art she exhibits the matronly air which distinguishes Juno and Ceres. Sometimes she is veiled and seated on a throne with lions at her side, at other times riding in a chariot drawn by lions. She wears a mural crown, that is, a crown whose rim is carved in the forms of towers and battlements. Her priests were called the Corribantes. Byron, in describing the city of Venice, which is built on a low island in the Adriatic Sea, borrows an illustration from Cybele. She looks a sea, Cybele, fresh from ocean, rising with her tiara of proud towers. At airy distance, with majestic motion, a ruler of the waters and their powers. Child Harold the Fourth. In Moore's Rhymes on the Road, the poet, speaking of alpine scenery, alludes to the story of Atalanta and Hippomenes thus. Even here, in this region of wonders, I find that light-footed fancy leaves truth far behind, or at least, like Hippomenes, turns her astray by the golden illusions he flings in her way. End of chapter 18